Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. If you please turn your Bibles to John chapter 17. As we will be looking at verses 20 through 23 this morning. Uh, plus a few other passages of scripture. And so keep your Bibles handy on your lap and your uh, thumbs ready to turn to some pages. This morning we're going to continue listening to and studying and hopefully taking in to the depths of our hearts what is typically called, uh, typically called the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in other parts of the scripture, you know that you have read the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be. That was a template that Jesus gave to his disciples to follow as they prayed. This actually is the Lord's Prayer. And what a privilege we have to be able to read it, to have it at our disposal, and to actually read the words of that our Lord brought before God the Father. On, his, on the behalf of the disciples of his time and then the rest of us who would follow because of the proclamation of the gospel and the penetration of the Holy Spirit to our hearts. So this morning we're gonna continue with that high priestly prayer where we have already read and heard Jesus presenting himself to the Father and then presenting his disciples to the Father and now, along with his disciples, the rest of those of us who would come after the disciples. The word is extremely important to us. It should be extremely important to us. Because it's, it's by the word of God that we come to the knowledge of God. Uh, one of the things that we have been studying in the men's group is, are the attributes of God. And... I don't know about the rest of the men, but I am amazed at the things that I have either forgotten or have been not very thoughtful about that brings me back to the remembrance of those magnificent attributes of God. There are two types of attributes that we see the scripture, those that God belong, those the attributes that belong to God and God only and then the attributes that belong to him that he dispenses to us as a reflection of who he is in our lives. Nevertheless, we need to know God our Father, and we need to know him intimately. And the only way that you're gonna know anything about God at all is through his holy word. And so I pray that we are constantly reminding ourselves to attend to the reading of his word, and not just the reading, but the concentration the thinking about what it is that the scripture is saying. Jesus enters into his intercessory ministry for us. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 7 verses 23 through 25 has to say. The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater number because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now, who's the them? Us, to make intercession for us. As the Lord faces the cross now, this, these are the last hours, before he is nailed to a cross, he goes to prayer and he brings not only himself, but he brings the disciples and the rest of us before the very throne of God. Now imagine, I know people always ask us to pray for one another. And I think that in many cases, there are those within Christendom that we hold very high. We have a very high estimate of them. And imagine one of those men who you hold in high esteem and is known by many 
that would say, I will be praying for you. Would you not be telling your friends, hey, so-and-so is going to be praying for me. He told me so. Pastor so-and-so, you can catch him on national TV every Sunday. He's praying for me. You would be bragging that this particular pastor who is known by so many and by reputation he is close to God that he would be praying for you. Dear ones, dear ones, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the, the Lord of glory, God the Son, very God, very man, is praying for us. Should we not be paying attention to what he has to say concerning us? Absolutely. Lord, what is it that you're bringing before the Father concerning me? What are you saying to the Father about me? Well, last week, there was one word that we should have focused in on. And it's the word sanctify. Sanctify. Jesus said about his disciples, and then, to, then it's going to include us, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. There is no place in the universe that we can find truth apart from the word of God. And it is by this word that brings us to our knees before God in humility in confession and repentance that brings about the work of the Holy Spirit as we are sanctified. Set apart for his glory. But this word also means purity, holiness. Jesus is saying, purify. As God, Father, you have set these people apart for me. Purify them. We should have honed in on that particular word because that's the will of God for us, the purity of his church, the people that call themselves by his name. Christian, are you pursuing purity? Are you considering the things that bounce around in your heart and your mind by word and deed? and by the intention of your heart, the motive. Those things that nobody else see but God that are deep in your soul. What are you doing? What am I doing? Well, this week, I wanna focus in on three words. And I'm gonna spend the bulk of the time on the second word, but here are the words. The first word is message or word. The second word is oneness or unity. That is unity in Christ or being in Christ and what that means, how it manifests itself. Second word is unity. The third word is glory, which should be reflecting our ultimate goal and the motivation of our hearts, of why we exist and what our lives look like or should look like on a day in and day out basis, and that in reality we are growing from one degree of glory to another. That is the salvation that has been brought to us is being manifest in greater purity and holiness and devotion. And we are seeing that. So as I concentrate more on the second word, it doesn't mean that the other two are not important because unity cannot take place unless the first one is already intact. You cannot, and we cannot together experience unity if we are not already united with Christ. You must be in union with Christ in order for you to experience these things that scripture is talking about. And the third word, glory, will certainly not be manifest unless you are united to Christ and living in such a way that there's a manifestation of your salvation in the way that you live. So let's pray as we look at these passages of scripture. Father, penetrate our hearts with the reality of your word, the truth of your word, the power of your word. 
that word that is brought to us by your Holy Spirit. As you have penetrated our hearts and we have bowed our lives before you in adoration, thanksgiving, and praise, crying out to you for mercy that you would save us and you have. So for those of us who call ourselves by the name of Jesus as Christians, Father, that your word would continue to do its work. Thank you that it will because you, through Paul, have already stated as Paul was convinced that you have begun a good work and you will see it to its completion to the day of Christ. We have your word. Transform us, Father. Make us pure as we pursue your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to John 17, 22, 23, 1, once again. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. Now we are included with the disciples but for those who believe in me through their word, the proclamation of the gospel, and everything else that the Holy Spirit is going to give to these men who will complete the canon of scripture. It's gonna be an expansion of the word that has been delivered to, from Jesus to these men. That they may all be one even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them. Did you get that? and loved them, loved us, even as you have loved me. I really pray and hope that the words that we sing in the morning, that those are truly in our heart. What love could possibly come down from heaven and become one of us and suffer for our redemption? It's a love unimaginable by human terms. We are sloppy in the use of that word today. We throw it around as if it's just any other word. Of course, the world is going to downgrade it. But we, as Christians, When we hear scripture like this, as you, that you love them as you have loved me, it should do something within the depths of our souls. Oh, Father, what great love you have for me. Not that I am the center of the universe, but that he has chosen to pour out his love on one such as I, I know me. And you know you. And we use Christian cliches. How are you, brother? Better than I deserve. What does that mean? You are the recipients of this marvelous salvation, unity in Christ, the glory of eternity. What should be the mark of our lives as we move forward in this world? This is the message, the word, the first word, the message. Do you remember in, recorded for us in Matthew chapter four, when Jesus is taken to the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy for 40 days? And at some point when Jesus is hungry, the enemy says, go ahead, speak to these stones, turn them into bread. And Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus was quoting from the Old Testament when the people in the wilderness, in their complaining that they had no food, gave them manna. What about us? 
Is the Word of God our sustenance? Do we feed spiritually on the Word of God? Do we look to the Word of God so that our life can be a reflection? I don't know. But I pose the question so that we can be encouraged to do that. He says, I do not ask, verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but those who believe in me through their word. The word that the disciples were going to bring to the world, this message of deliverance, which had been received as the Lord gave it to them. Do you remember as we've read through John, those that followed didn't receive the word because they liked darkness and their sin greater than the proclamation of, of the message of the kingdom of God. But these had received the word of God. The very, very word that Jesus was giving them. Not just any message, but it was the message of salvation. And that is the glory that is revealed in and through us as a result of the efficacious work of the Holy Spirit through his word. It brings about the very purpose for which he has sent it. You already know that the scripture says that God has sent forth his word and it will not return void, but accomplish the very purpose for which he sent it. Sends out his word and it accomplishes the very thing, the very purpose. The proclamation of the gospel in a general sense has been preached and is being preached to the entire world. The effect that it'll have is what the Holy Spirit does as he penetrates our hearts with a reality of our sinfulness, our separation from God and our need for salvation. And when we bow low and cry out for mercy, we are saved because of the work of the word. Before the unity of Christ can take place in each individual life, the word must be proclaimed. Without the proclamation of the word of salvation, there is no salvation. And when the gospel is preached, people come to know Christ and are united with Christ. But before the union of Christ can take place, the proclamation must take place. You know, oftentimes we are asked by people, would you please pray for so-and-so? He is my brother, my sister, my niece, my nephew, my grandfather, and the list goes on, that they would be saved. And we do, don't we? What do they need to hear? The gospel. Who's going to take it to them? You are. So yes, we will pray, but you have a message to proclaim and you have, you've, you've been commissioned to take that gospel. How, how will they hear? Listen to Romans 10, 14 through 17. How then will they call upon him who they have not believed? All of our loved ones, Susie and I pray for our brothers and sisters and nieces, our nephews, grandnieces, grandnephews who don't know the Lord, that they would be saved. Some of them don't want to hear the gospel because they don't want to hear the gospel. And so we're tempted to keep our mouth shut, but we have a proclamation. How will they call on him who they have not heard and how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? I am not the only preacher in this room. You are too. How will they preach unless they are sent? Have you been commissioned? Yes, you have. And you have been sent to proclaim this marvelous, magnificent gospel. Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good tidings, of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? 
So faith comes from hearing, and hearing from the Word of God. What message was delivered to them? The saving gospel, the glorious saving gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given to the apostles, passed down through the generations to us today. So you and I are the direct recipients of the word that the apostles received and then commissioned to finish the, the rest of the New Testament so that we can have a copy and know what God has to say to us about our salvation and our life. For he has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Everything you need to know about your relationship with God and how you ought to live is in the word of God, directly and indirectly. But you and I are the indirect recipients of this marvelous word in a timely fashion as the Lord appointed your day of salvation. Before the foundations of the world, your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Before there was a day that you ever lived. And he has numbered your days. Okay? So we live by it. We must live by it. The good news. Before unity with the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit can take place. This proclamation must be heralded throughout the entire world. Not only heralded, but received. A person can say, I know that, I know that, I know that. Listen, I was catechized for nine years every day. I went through the catechism and I could answer questions that were posed, I memorized those answers because I was going to be quizzed on it and I wanted a good grade. But it had no effect on my, on my soul, none whatsoever. Because I was told that I was united with Christ on the basis of something else other than repentance and crying out for mercy. I was told that I had a relationship with God through my baptism as a three-week-old a three old baby. Not so, not so. There is no other regeneration apart by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit as Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter three, you must be born from above. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. The unity that Jesus has given us is a spiritual unity. Not a unity that looks like the organization of some big denomination where there is uniformity of everything that takes place when they gather together. No, it's, an, it's a deep inner spiritual union that takes place when the Holy Spirit takes his word, penetrates us to repentance, and we are born again. How then is this unity seen outwardly as an expression of our lives, of those of us who received Christ? So it brings us to the second word, unity or oneness. Verses 21 and 23. Combine these two. What we see here is a model. A modeling that flows from the unity that is experienced by our triune God that should be experienced by us, his followers. We should be a people of unity. Not uniformity, but unity. Unity in the spiritual sense. And how? By the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit that takes his word and transforms us into the likeness in the image of, of Christ. Listen to these two passages, 23, 21 and 23. That they all may be one even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. It's the kind of unity that's a reflection of the work of our triune God in our personal lives. Verse 23, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. A reflection of divine love in our midst. So in order for us to understand what this oneness or unity really means to its fullest, 
Let's look at a few passages of scripture that give us the practical application of what this unity means among us. As we have been united to Christ, now we are united to one another as a representation of saved people to a lost and dying world. Okay? Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Listen to what it says. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, see that? In Christ. There's a unity in Christ first. If there is any consolation of love, the divine love of God, if there is any fellowship with the Spirit, so now we have a Trinitarian experience. Any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent in one purpose. So let's, let's look at it in its parts. What does this unity look like? This is how Paul outlines it for us. Being of the same mind. Unity takes place when we are committed to a biblical mindset. Not a worldly mindset, a biblical mindset. How is that going to take place? It's going to take place through the Word of God as we have developed and established, maintained, and continue to grow in biblical thinking. Biblical thinking. Listen. We are about to vote in a new president. What kind of nonsense have you been hearing that would want to form you into the likeness of that kind of thinking? You have a responsibility and an obligation as a Christian to vote on the basis of what you have been taught concerning the holiness of God and the worth of people because we are created in the image and likeness of God. Are you thinking biblically? I pray you're not thinking politically. Take your political thinking caps off. Don't think politically. That lasts for a second. You must think eternally. And if you are not convinced in the depth of your heart of the sanctity of human life, it's not voting your conscience, it's voting the truth. It's the truth of what God has brought to us. And not only that, dear ones, but each and every day as we go to the world and we are being bombarded by a, a worldly mindset, we are called to put on the mind of Christ. Here it is. The scripture says you have the mind of Christ. The word of God is the mind of Christ. Think biblically of the same mind. I know husbands and wives battle each other all the time. And we say to each other, I am not like you. I think differently. Of course. Men are men and women are women. Oh, that's, that's a truism. That's a, a fact. <laughs> and we do think differently. But when it comes to worldly things, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife must be thinking biblically. United in having the same mind. Second, maintaining the same love. It's agape love. It's an unselfish, other-centered, Christ-reflecting love. How does God want me to love my wife as Christ loved the church? I don't think I've even begun to scratch the surface of what that means in the 52 years that Susie and I have been married. I want to. I'm learning. I'm growing. I pray that I'm growing. And I pray that it's a reflection of the love of Christ and that I'm not backsliding back into my sinful old ways. The reflecting of the love of Christ, agape, others-centered. That's what Philippians talks about here. 
Number three, united in the spirits, means single-souled. A one-souled individual is compared to a split-souled, or as James put it, a double-minded man. What does that mean? It means that your affection should be holy to Christ, and as a result of that, then you are living, you're living out united in the Spirit because you're walking according to the Spirit, as it talks about in Galatians that we'll see quickly in a few minutes. A double-minded or a split soul man has an affection that is split, and yet the Scripture says a man cannot love two masters. You can't love two masters. Either you will hate the one, despise the other, love the one, and not the other. You can't be divided in your affections. Within the deepest part of who you are, the very spirit of who you are, has got to be submitted and dedicated to Christ and Christ only. And it's out of the overflow of your relationship and union with Christ that others will see that love that single devotion. The last one, intent on one purpose. What is the one purpose? The one purpose is the glorification of God in the proclamation of his word and the love of the brethren. Intent on one purpose. To demonstrate to the world that we belong to Christ and because we belong to Christ, these things that the scripture says are going to be manifest in our presence. I know that's difficult because people make you mad. They make you mad because they don't bow down to your selfish desires and whims. Right? You guys are a little bit too quiet. If that's not enough, turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Just to see another example of what this unity is all about. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord implore you. Implore us to what? To walk in a manner worthy of your calling with which you have been called. You have been called. And how do we do this? With all humility, with gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Wow. So let's look at the portions of it, the pieces of it. Humility. Humility. Another word for humility is lowliness, to bow down. It's to have a proper biblical estimation of ourselves and the treatment of others in the view of Christ. In the view of Christ, there is my example. In the view of Christ, if I have a proper estimation of myself, I am going to humble myself before my Savior. And how I treat others is going to be a reflection of that lowliness, humility. If we don't humble ourselves, he will humble us. Humility ought to be the mark of the church, not what the world says humility is, what the scripture says. And in that humility will come gentleness. Another word for that is meekness. It's tenderness, dear one. Tenderness. What did Jesus say? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. How I long to gather you like a hen does her chicks. Tenderness. Is there tenderness in your home? Is there tenderness in your workplace? 
Is there tenderness with your children and grandchildren and your neighbors? Is there tenderness in our midst? Patience, that's long suffering. That is a slowness to react in the fashion that I want to and I am entitled to instead of responding properly of what it means to walk by the Spirit. And with the excuse, that's just the way I am. You knew that when you married me? That's not, that's not patience. That's not long-suffering. It means you gotta have, gotta bring that emotion under the control of the Holy Spirit instead of letting the emotion be in control of your life, usurping the Holy Spirit that abides in you. Tolerance, forbearance. It doesn't have to do with accepting everything that everybody has to say and you're tolerant of everything. You, you should not be tolerant of the stupidity of what's taking place in our society. Anything that goes against the scripture, you should not be tolerant of, but you should be forbearing, meaning that it's a personal thing of bringing yourself under the control of the Holy Spirit in your relationship with one another. Today is a self-grading time. How are you doing? <laughs> How are we doing? Well, Pastor, you're not making me feel very good. <laughs> no, I am not making myself feel very good. Listen, I'm a Christian. I want you to see these things in me. And I want to see them in you. Most importantly, the Lord wants to see them in his church. Notice how closely these two passages cor correspond and reflect to two other passages. And I'll just read them for you and I won't make a lot of comment on it. But turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Starting in verse 4. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not brag or is arrogant, love does not act uncomingly, unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it is not provoke, does not take into account a wrong suffered, it doesn't keep a little black book of all the stuff that people have done to me. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, and endures all things. Now all of those things are not everything that is out in the world, but what is contained in the scripture of how we ought to live according to what love is. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against there is no law. What, is there, what does it mean that there is no law? It means there are no limitations. How much love and patience and kindness and joy and so forth can you pour out from your life to others without limits? Here, let me be loving to you. I've got an eyedropper. You can have some of this. Here you go. No, it's without limit, without measure. 
should be gushing forth from us. But I got a problem and you've got a problem perhaps. And I stand with that problem every day before a mirror and it is me and my selfishness and the issues of the heart that God wants to penetrate and bring to a greater sanctification. What then is the purpose of the unity which the Lord is praying for his followers? It brings us to the third word, glory. Glory. The glory that Jesus says that he is bringing from the Father to them is this magnificent salvation, redemption, forgiveness of sins, restoration, How much glorious could you experience in your life than to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've been redeemed by God the Father through Jesus Christ the Lord and you know it, you know it, but at the end of this life when you close your eyes, the minute that you close them and you open up, you are in the presence of God the Father face to face. Or do you live on a daily basis with the load of the world crying out woe is me and you're wringing your hands and you're pulling out the little hair that you have complaining that you live in this horrible place instead of being grateful and thankful that you are the redeemed of God it's glorious and we have been saved for that glory. The day is coming when we will see that glory. The glory that Jesus says, give to me, Father, the glory that I experienced before he became a man. 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. For what purpose? So that the world may know that you sent me not just sent me, but that you loved them. What kind of love? The same way you loved me. My brain is too small. I cannot understand and contain that, but I believe it. I believe it with all my heart to the depth of my very soul, that I am loved by God in the same fashion that he loved his son, not because of what I have done. It's not on the basis of my merit. It's on the basis of the merit of Christ Jesus the Lord who lived, who became a man, lived a sinless life, died, rose again, ascended, and is returning for his people. Do you have that kind of conviction? If you don't have that kind of conviction, you have not received the message of salvation, you are not united with Christ, and you don't have the hope of glory, and you're playing the religious game, hoping that by attending church, or I, I don't know, what, whatever kind of activity we may think that is meritorious towards our salvation, it's a game this is not a game. This is a life. This is a life. It is a manifestation of divine love through Christ Jesus the Lord for his bride. That on the day, that there'll be a day when God the Father will present his bride, the church, to his son in splendor, in glorious splendor. Between now and then, we are called to purity. We're called to obedience. We're called to submission. We're called to humility. And we are called to demonstrate and manifest the unity by the Spirit of God. We're called to live spiritual lives in practical sense. The manifestation of the Father through the Son has now been given to the followers of Jesus. 
Will the glory of God be manifest through us, dear ones? Will the glory of God be manifest through us who call ourselves by the name of Christ? And if there is a hindrance, and you know what that hindrance is, it's calling to repentance and to humility, confession before the Lord and forsaking those things that keep you, the stifle, the glory of God. God the Father was glorified through the redemptive, atoning, propitiatory work of Christ on the cross. You cannot know the Father apart from the Son. You cannot know the Son apart from the Father. And you cannot know the Father and the Son apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a Trinitarian, I, I even hesitate to say the word thing, it's a Trinitarian experience with the Holy God. If you're just calling yourself a Christian because you've been through a few motions of sorts, I'm calling you to repentance from that. The church must be called to repentance. Read Revelation. Jesus called those churches that he said, I have this against you, to repentance. To repentance from worldly thinking, from the influence and the common Con <laughs> contamin <laughs> contamination of the world. I I'm, I'm still learning English. <laughs> Thank you for your patience and forbearance. Contamination of the world in our thinking and in our heart. We have been united to Christ. What a glorious, marvelous thing that is. And that divine love must be manifested among us so that the world will know, what are these people all about, really? Because you know today, the church is taking it on the chin by what we do and how we live. And our participation in an agreement with the world. No, 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 dear ones. We're being called. Listen to what Jesus is praying. Father, purify my bride. Set her apart. And by the work of your Holy Spirit, transform them into a body of unity for your glory. We only have one message of salvation. And that salvation message comes in this power when we are united with Christ and the Holy Spirit works through us. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. And let me close with, with this. Starting in verse 11. Start, let's start verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him. Speaking about Jesus, in him. All of the in hymns in, in this passage, and I would encourage you to read it sometime. With a view to administration suitable for the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth, in him. Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Did you hear that? What's the purpose of your calling and election and salvation? To the praise of his glory. That you be to the praise of his glory. That verb is ever present, day in, day out. In him also, 
after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having been also also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who has given us as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own purposes, to the praise of his glory. Did you receive the message? Did the message of the gospel of salvation penetrate your hearts and bring you to a place of repentance, confession, and crying out for mercy? If sincerely that took place, you have been united with Christ eternally, and the glory of eternity rests on you. And if that's the case, you will be a reflection of the majesty of the glorious God that saved you, and unity and peace will take place. And you will be to the praise of his glory. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, majestic word, holy word, efficacious word, your word, your very own word, who became flesh and dwelt among us, suffered for our sake, redeemed us from hell, and brought us into a glorious union with you by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that we would live as reflections of that glorious salvation. And thank you, Father, that we can read these precious words of the prayer of our Savior, our great high priest. Lord, that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. Work in and through us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Craig.